Good morning. I can't see any of you, but I trust there are some of you, right? Thank you. That helps. That's a confidence check. Well, thanks all everyone for, for coming out on this. Actually, what turned out to be a really pretty nice Sunday morning. Uh, and we're going to talk um, about some really fascinating stuff. Uh, there you are. Oh, yeah. Hey. Um, Good to meet you. <laughs> Christina has a, a really interesting life story, and I'd like to just sort of start by talking about your origins a little bit. Maybe you could begin by where you're from and, and how you got interested in plants. Okay, so I am, uh, was born in Milan, Italy, Bay, Bay, way back then. And um, I've lived there most, you know, the first part of my life. Uh, I moved here about 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, for the longest time, I thought I would become a doctor. And then I, when it was time to pick this, um, this course of studies, I pretty quickly realized that dealing with human pain and, and suffering was probably too much for me. And um, um, I had another resource in the sense that I had a lot of exposure to the natural world. My dad came from a place in the mountains, and uh, so every minute we wouldn't spend in school or being in the city, we would be out in the woods and um, just going around. And so um, I thought, well, perhaps I should become a doctor of the earth and, um, and do that. And so I get into agricultural sciences. I thought at the beginning agriculture was such a neat, orderly way of tend to nature. Uh, it was so bucolic and so lovely and so wonderful. I knew nothing that agriculture is actually one of the most polluting activities that we, we do. Uh, but that, you know, but the sense of a neatly plowed field and all that was really very intriguing to me. So that's what I got into. What was that like to have your relationship with it change a little bit as you came to understand that it's, it's not necessarily always in harmony with the natural world? Well, it wasn't, I mean, it, it, this is a sudden thing that creeps on you as you study these things. So it wasn't like a sudden realization of it, but you get into the issues and, and I don't know, I think my, my, my point was try to keep a constructive attitude and just to say, okay, I'm here, um, freedom of participation, I want to do something for it, pretty much. Yeah. And I always work in, in this interface between agriculture and the environment, pretty much. So you were working in, in industry and in, mm -hmm. in agricultural science right. in Italy. And how, when, when did it sort of first dawn on you, or, or, or how did you first come to understand that plants have this ability to, to work to actually clean up the ground that they're in? We were actually working, I was working in Italy with a, with a company which was the first company that basically grew out of the beginning of the environmental regulation you know, times, right? You know, clean, the equivalent of the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act and, and all that. Uh, people had to dispose of their waste. In industry had to dispose of their waste, and it realized that it cost them money, right? Uh, this company I was working with uh, basically found, basically figured out that if you think a waste, of a waste, not as a waste, but as something else, and you don't think, I'm going to toss it out, but reuse it, then it's not a waste anymore. So my work was to uh, figure out what was in the waste and see how it would impact agricultural systems and the plants and the crops and all that. And in doing that, you realize that, that these products bring with them something onto the ground and you need to figure out how much plants are going to take up and how much plants are going to be leaving in the ground and how much is going to accumulate in the soil. Uh, and so it was pretty natural to see, well, plants have a mechanism obviously to take things out of the soil into, in, into their tissue pretty much. Why don't we exploit that? Why don't we exploit that? I mean, was that something that, was that a field that you sort of tapped into? Was that something that you kind of came to on your own and you started to look more and more into? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's as, as usual, the inventions are, are rarely the, you know, the, I mean, there's strikes of genius, but this is not, I mean, most of the cases, it really comes from the combined expertise and, and reading and understanding how things work. Uh, there was a lot of concern, obviously, in how much of these chemicals, let name it heavy metals, and just to make the, the easy case, how much would that be transferred into crops and how bad it would be for people eating it. And so that was really the body of the, of the evidence, is how much can you put safely on the land without creating a, a, an issue on the food chain. Uh, and then you just flip the issue 180 degrees and say, okay, if they take it up, if it's a concern, could this be utilized to remove contaminants from the ground, which is a critical, difficult thing because contaminants are finely dispersed into the soil, and so it's very, very difficult to tap into every single nook and cranny, a little piece of, you know, of the soil to yeah, pull it out. Yeah, say more about that. Why is it such a, it's, it's a really <laughs> tough nut to crack getting like contaminated dirt, like contaminated, you know, even a contaminated water is a different story, but contaminated dirt in particular, the usual way to do it is to what? Dig it up, yeah. chuck it out, and bury it under more dirt, right? Right. So why, what makes it such a difficult problem? Because, you know, 
because the contaminants are, are finely dispersed in soil, and handling soil is obviously much different than handling water, right? You have to dig them out. It's, there's a lot of energy goes into it, and so it becomes quickly very cost prohibitive. The other big issue, particularly for the heavy metals, but also from some other, other like man-made contaminants, is that they tend to stick to soil in a very, very strong way. They tend to be absorbed into the, the clays, the, the organic matter, all this fraction of soil. So once they're in, they will slowly leach out and create an issue, but they're very hard if you wanted to extract them. You have to use very harsh methods to do that because they're very tightly bound. You have to wash it, effectively. Right. Washing dirt. Yeah. So that did, doesn't seem like a great idea on its no. face, right? Washing dirt. Right. So um, <laughs> eventually you came to the States. How did that happen? How did you get involved with Argonne? And then how did we get into your first sort of real big final remediation projects here in the States. Okay, I, I came to, to the States because I was married to somebody who was here. My husband is, is here. Uh, so at some point it turned out that was the best thing for us to do. I got involved with Argonne because obviously you meet somebody that knows somebody, knows somebody, and, and I got to Argonne. And when I met people and my, the person who eventually hired me at Argonne, um, Argonne was very, very busy in doing a lot of land reclamation and restoration work. This was uh, the early 90s, and uh, both the Department of Energy, who owns Argonne and runs, uh, you know, and, and operates Argonne, um, was interested in technologies that clean up their legacy waste. Uh, not only that, but there were a lot of other people who were interested in environmental impacts of various human activities. You know, uh, the military were interested in how to, you know, restore land after they had done all their training exercises and tore up the whole thing. There were a lot of people, this was really the, the key moment for, for environmental technologies to develop, so it was an easy fit. Mm -hmm. So one of those first uh, mile markers on this, this trip was this project in, in Ohio, which was a, a, a legacy contamination mm -hmm. of, of what exactly, plutonium? Plutonium, yes. Yeah, tell, tell us about that. So this is a plant that DOE own, owns, and I think now is in basically in uh, reconditioning, I guess, uh, in Ohio, in a place, in a town called Mound, uh, because it wasn't actually, uh, you know, Indian Mound. And it's up on a hill, and they were processing plutonium to make uh, triggers for bombs and uh, to make um, power batteries, solar batteries that go onto uh, satellite, satellites and, and other space station and things like that. Highly secret uh, operation. Um, this is a secret, this is a, a black lab. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, I, I, at that time I was a foreign national. I could not go beyond the cafeteria. I wouldn't be <laughs> <laughs> able to go anywhere else. So, uh, but the problem is, over time, you know, they were processing plutonium, and one leak today, one leak to the ne ne next day. Of course, and there was a, a, a loss of, of, of plutonium nitrate eventually going into a, a, a canal. You say, of course, but is that actually common? Like, if you're, can we assume that if there's a plant that's processing plutonium, they probably dropped some now and again? It's probably plausible. I think it wouldn't happen now uh -huh. uh, because people are a lot more sensitive to things. But that time, I mean, this is a norm everywhere. I mean, we've seen this is a typical history, not just for Mound. I mean, for, for any industry, any, any place that produces something, you know, the attention to these back in, we're talking about the 50s, the 60s, you know, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So probably at that time was fairly standard uh, yes. operation, I guess. <laughs> so what, what is it? What is the so now the, you have this area that they're trying to remediate? What does it look like? I mean, are they buildings? Are they I haven't been fields? there in a long time, but it um. was a basically a, a, a canal, and it was actually very nice to look at. And there was plutonium in there, and we were actually looking at a technology that could actually, as you said, wash it out with the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, can the plutonium be removed? Uh, and if so, what does it mean? Uh, and so the technology used very very harsh chemicals to try to pull it out, and it actually was successful in, in pulling it out except the soil that was left was like a toothpaste consistency. It wouldn't have any structural properties. You, you couldn't hold a, a pin on it and without having it go down. Um, it was really not reusable for anything else. So at that point, you know, uh, if you have to dispose of it anyways, you might as well save yourself some money and dispose of it to begin with, right? So it wasn't really a solution. There's no, yeah, what's the point of cleaning it? You're just going right. to chuck it then. Right, right. And actually, um, in a certain sense, I know it sounds really bad, but when you have this contaminated, plutonium is an alpha emitter, it means that you have to take it in internally to be harmed by it. So you could actually, perhaps not touch it, but go very close to it, and you wouldn't really have a lot of, uh, of problems with it. So, so one of the thoughts was like, is it more risky to pull it all out um, and 
create dust and create churn it up, churn it sure. up then just leave it there now buried under layers and layers things that it's not going to go anywhere it's going to just stay in there and just deed the land forever perhaps yeah. so that you don't have put put some nice facilities there where nobody's going to be ever in touch with it and, and let it sit unfortunately these you know we cannot put back things as the way they were before so well it seems like the paradigm for a long time and still to a large extent is is either to sequester it, right, to just sort of bury it, or throw it away, or just you know fence off the land and not go there. Or whatever. So none of these allow for really mm -hmm. reuse, repurposing, right. regeneration of the land that they're on. How does how do some of the approaches that you work on differ from from that? So we tried to take the green way to to clean up these legacy waste, whether it's water, soil, or whatever it is. Uh, we're using plants. Uh, and obviously, we talked before, plants take up things, you know, contaminants you know, or elements or, or nutrients from the soil. Why not use it for, for these? The beauty of it is that it's totally green. It's activated by the sunlight because uh, obviously trees use sunlight to uh, transpire water and, water. and water movement is really the motor, the, the engine that, that pulls everything out, out of the ground. Uh, so that's greener and so it should solve a lot of energy concerns and costs, you know, that, that have to do with that. Um, and ideally, if you use plants, you also remove something. So you actually do something to, to actually transport the waste away. Not only that, but you know, if when we go into other type, type of pollutants, which are like organic and degradable stuff, even long term, they actually tend to create, plants tend to create a, a good environment for, for in the root system. Therefore, you have more biological activity, more soil, soil works better and actually can detoxify itself uh, faster. So it's, it's a proactive approach, if you will which hopefully costs less than, than what you would have if you had to dig it all out and take it somewhere mm -hmm. for, for now, perpetuity. Are you just moving it? Or I mean, are, are there, is there chemistry that actually that does detoxify it, that breaks it down? The, if you, so we're now we're not talking about metals or radionuclides. Those are non-negradable so that you don't do anything. You just move their place. You know? Got it. But if you have, you're talking about solvents, for instance, which is the, the dry cleaner solvents. You know, we all clean way, you know, our, our, our clothes to dry cleaners. And until up to very recently, they use a compound that's called trichloroethane, which is the TCE and, and PCE. Uh, and those are chemicals that man-made, and they are somewhat degradable. What happens in the plants, the plants take it up, but they go, these compounds go with the water into the plant. And partly they get degraded into uh, the plant tissue because scientists pretty much have found that plants have a similar uh, way to detoxify these compounds that we have in our own liver. That's why they're called the green livers. Um, part of it will go <laughs> they in. Are. They're, they're, that's how they're called. <laughs> um, and, uh, but some of it actually gets to go into the air. And again, on Amino's thing, I, you know, hopefully, you know, you don't, don't be too scared about it because these chemicals are really, really a nasty problem where there is no sunlight. But when you have sunlight, many of these compounds turn out to be much more easily oxidized and, and degraded by, by the UV radiation and, and light. So for instance, this chemical, the TCE that I was talking, is, is basically pretty much perpetual if you have it 30 feet below ground, but it it's, has a half-life of about a week in air under sunlight. So. So it's just a matter of getting it up to where the sun can shine on it. Yeah, yeah, and again, it's a, we don't have the magic bullet that can bring things back to the way they were. So oftentimes, scientists and regulators and everybody else have the job of deciding where is the least the path of least damage or least you know problem, and this seems to be one. Yeah, and this is and that gets into a little bit of what we saw in the in the video, the uh, the site at Argon. Mm -hmm. Th those were also those kinds of the yes. same kinds of solvents yes. under yes. the ground, right? Well, tell us a little bit about that. That side. I mean, we got a little peek of what we were looking at. Yeah. But what's going on under the earth there? So we have this site um, is a site where argon used to dispose of waste back in the 50s, and uh, right now what's happening is that there's an area where soil is contaminated, and then the groundwater flows through that and, and just moves the contamination, you know, southwards, going down gradients to it. Um, back in 1998, the Department of Energy was really interested in using their facilities. Um, as a way to demonstrate technologies that were in the, in the cooking stages of, of being prepared and, and, and studied um, and try to verify it at the larger scale. So they gave us funding to, uh, to actually put in about a thousand trees, which we did put in in 1999. Um, the problem there is that the pollution is about 30 feet below ground. So the trick was how to force these trees to push their roots down to 30 feet below ground to collect the water that is flowing at that, at that depth. 
And so what I usually take, I tell people that visit my site is I take the height of the tree now and flip the, the, the height 180 degrees, and that's how deep the roots are growing. And what we basically have done is trick them into believing there is a drought, and these trees are poplars and willows and, and trees like that. And, uh, and they are genetically predisposed to throw their roots down if they sense drought. It's a, their way to adjust to drought. They dig deep if, they, if, they dig dry, deep they if they have a, a drought stress, they have, if they think they're stressed. Um, and so that's what they did. They actually went down, and, uh, and now we know that they are there because we can actually trace some of the pollutants into their tissue, uh, and we know where the, the pollutants are, and they are about 30 feet below ground. So, um, so that's, we, we like our trees. We know them one by one. You do? Yeah. Do they have names or numbers? They have little numbers, yeah. Serial so numbers? All, yeah. Nicknames, maybe? Mm, no. Yeah, no, not yet. But. Do you have any, uh, I mean, it's an interesting place where you are, I and mean, it is a lab, right? I mean, yeah. we saw pictures of you with, you know, gloves and uh, all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. out there. But, um, but it is also natural, if yeah. not nature, exactly. <laughs> right. Do you feel any connection with the place? It's great. And actually, at the beginning, it, you know, and, and we, we watched it change through the years. It's about 10 years old now. And right now, it's actually a wonderful place that if it weren't for the mosquitoes, I would be happy having lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it is a great place, and it's very, very, um, I don't know, I feel, my, I feel I'm privileged to be able to work there because it's, um, it's such a recharging place. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part of it is that we are now thinking about, now this process is going to go on for a couple of decades at least because, you know, it takes a long time to, you know, even, even with a system like this, it takes time um, to, to basically finish it up and, and be done. Uh, but we're already thinking about succession. So we have poplars and, and willows, and these are non, um, not the ideal ecosystem plants for this part of the world. And so what we are trying to do is transition into an oak savanna eventually. So we are starting to plant a few oaks here and there. They take much longer time to develop. You've seen those trees that are about 10 years old and they are like 40 feet tall. So they grow really fast. Right. So eventually really they'll, like change. they'll, they'll change in, into something else that takes a longer time. And at some point, do you imagine it being indistinguishable from the forest? Hopefully, yes. Yeah. It will always probably be fenced in as an area because of other activities in, in lab, but, but it will be indistinguishable from the forest preserve, which is close by. Yeah. It seems that, like such an elegant solution in some ways. I mean, obviously, there, there's been contamination. Nature has been scarred in some way. And then you have, you're sort of making, putting nature back to right. work to to at least you know, make it better, if not make it exactly like it was before. I mean, does it strike that chord in you, that elegant, beautiful science thing that so many scientists talk about? Does it kind of resonate with something in you? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I don't know, to me, beauty is everything. And, and, uh, you know, and it goes back to you know, the, the conservation people, Aldo Leopold and all that, and all that, all that they had to propose as far as you know, what is it and the ethical value of keeping the land. Um, vibrant, and uh, it, it all comes together in a way or another. So there's multiple feeds that go in from the science. Obviously, it's, it's a, an interesting thing for me as a scientist, but also from a person who lives on the land, you know, whether it's city or, or wood or, or wherever. Um, it's it's, our, it's our, our roots, literally, you know, <laughs> that have to live with, with, with their roots. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so what are some other applications you can see for this? Like, where, are there some places you'd really like to get your hands on? Where would you like to I would love to work? work on the Chicago River. You know, I live in the city. I live in Hyde Park. Um, I, um, I think the Chicago River is such a wonderful, um, wonderful artery, you know, that crosses the city. And unfortunately, there's a lot of pollution, whether in the water or, you know, runoff that comes from, you know, whatever feeds the water into that. And I think we could really have a, a really good way of addressing that through some of our systems. Not everywhere, obviously, but if you think of an oasis here and there, and then you imagine putting in a, a bike path on it so that you actually have people biking over there instead of on, you know, Milwaukee Avenue between cars parked and, and flowing traffic, which is kind of dangerous. Yeah. Uh, it would actually combine different points in that, and, and you could actually do a lot of fun things. So it would beautify it and develop yeah. it. Uh, but, uh, At are the same time, with a with solid science basis for a solid technology-driven approach, and, and you actually impact positively the environment that you're in. Let's speculate. I mean, how would that work? What would that look like, and what would it be? What, how would, would you imagine it? If money were no object, let's if say. If money were no object, I would actually do a, a good, you know, GIS analysis, perhaps, and see what is the land use around, uh, around the river, uh, on, the ben on, on the banks, and, and so on, and then carve out a few parts where you actually uh, control the runoff, and, and you actually 
filter off water before it, it, it recharges the stream, right? You want to have water go flowing into the, in, into, the, into the river itself. You want it clean. So you can use a system like that to actually clean, clean the water and recharge the river. And then you have, obviously, perhaps an urban designer who can think of how to make it pretty. And, you know, uh, but you have a function in there, working in there. And that would connect, perhaps, green infrastructure. You control sewer overflows and things like that. So, yeah, I, I think we could really have definitely have a role. Yeah. What would that look? I mean, would they be trees? Would they be like? Would they be trees? Wetlands? It could be wetlands. It could be trees. It could be, you know, various vegetation, native vegetation, of all sorts and and, um, and sizes. Uh, we could put um, switchgrass, which is a nice crop. We are, we're studying that a lot as a biofuel crop, but it could definitely have applications for this. It also has deep roots that could help stabilize the banks and and be pretty. Um, Lots of different things. Huh. So what's what's preventing us from doing this or having done this already? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you having the idea. That, I that's having, a start. The, having the idea is a start, I guess. I think there's other people have similar ideas. Perhaps the good thing would be to get all together and, and, and have it. And then obviously it's a city. There's a lot of uh, things that have to happen to have <laughs> that. <laughs> Who owns the land and what you do and having a master plan and all yeah. that. So. Do you see other applications for urban <laughs> settings, brownfields? I mean, we talked about the dry cleaners, for example. Yeah. The, you know, the Chicago is pocked with these things, or, or old gas stations. Right, right. Well, There's a lot of potential applications there. There's also um, a potential, you know, I'm thinking, oh, there's, we have a lot of um, land that's not used to its maximum. It's, it's abandoned, or it's degraded, or it's not necessarily polluted itself, but it's like derelict, let's say, in a lot of parts. I think if we started putting plants on them, we would actually uh, start building back some of the quality in the soil. And so perhaps take up and sequester a lot of the negative things that are there, but also improve the, 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 um, the physical structure of soil. But at the same time, I think it would improve the, um, the looks of it. And, uh, and perhaps it would contribute to people's happiness a little more. Um, and then the other thing I was, we were thinking is that if we could actually use some of this land and we could grow something that we could harvest for making power, uh, we could actually contribute just a little bit to the um, energy balance and, and, and supplying our own energy. And, uh, and perhaps heating some places where you actually would grow crops, um, you know, vegetables or tomatoes or something in a, in a cleaner way than if you did it straight in the soil, which is obviously something that may be difficult. Uh, you just played it out like four steps already right. just now. I mean, that's the systems <laughs> approach that you're working right. on, right? I mean, yeah. if it, yeah. it seems to me if there's anything that um, most uh, connects with the humanities, perhaps mm -hmm. it's that, this, this systems approach where you're really, you're not looking at solving one problem. You're looking at setting into motion a chain that right. addresses lots of problems. Right. Right? So we'll fo let's follow that out in a little bit more detail. I mean, you have this idea about marrying the phytoremediation with, with biofuels, bio uh, crops that we could use for, for yeah. reasonably clean energy, or at least not, not um, you know, hydrocarbons, right? right? How would that work? So um, if you look at the biggest perceived issue that's plaguing the biofuels um, development is this question of land use. Basically, the idea that if you grow biofuels, you need land. And if you use the land for grow biofuels, we grow less food crops, and therefore the cost of tortilla flour increases, and, and somewhere else in the world will have to take down the rainforest to grow the food that they need. Uh, so that's a big, big discussion. Um, what we are thinking is that perhaps there's plenty of land that would be considered marginal for, for the main crops like corn and soybean and all that, which would not be marginal for biofuel crops. Some of that land is contaminated, like we, what we have seen. Some land is actually creating an issue, uh, like in agriculture. You know, we have corn, and corn, unfortunately, still um, uses about 50 or 60 percent of the nitrogen we put on it. So the farmer buys 100 units of fertilizer, about 50 to 60 stay in the crop, in and they are really used for the corn to grow and, and create corn and be used. The rest is basically dispersed in the environment. That's a tremendous waste, uh, obviously. Um, because that, that nitrogen goes into waters, and we all heard about the, the algal blooms and, and all the problems that, that creates, together with phosphorus and, and other things. So what we thought is, obviously, the problem in, in recapturing that nitrogen is really how, how corn is grown and, and the spatial features of where you grow it and, and how close you are to the water and, and how the water travels from the corn to, to a water body that eventually will go 
into the Mississippi River and, and then obviously in the Gulf of Mexico. So what we are, we are trying to demonstrate um, is that these biofuel crops can be used if you engineer a system similar to what our phytoremediation systems are doing, if you uh, basically reconceive your agricultural landscape so you have corn and next to it you grow these crops, they have roots that are deep enough to intercept that nitrogen and prevent them from moving into the creeks and the surface water and, and obviously creating a lot of other problems, including nitrous oxide, which comes from the degradation of, of nitrate. And it's a very potent greenhouse gas. It's about 300 times um, more warming than, than CO2. And so if you remove it from that cycle, you actually have gotten yourself a free fertilizer because you have some free fertilizer you scavenge out of something else. And you've addressed two major issues, which is water contamination and greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. So we hope this is a win-win, and we are demonstrating that in a new field site right here in Illinois. Oh, man. So I mean, that nitrogen is <laughs> going to fertilize something, right? Yeah. It's going to either fertilize right. algae that we don't like, right. or it's going to fertilize something right. good. And so in this case, you would have, so you'd get the output of the crop, You'd also get the filtration protecting the waterways. Um, no. That doesn't sound so good. Okay. Um, and you are um, you're cleaning, up, cleaning up the soil as well. It's, uh, is it, are people doing it? Is it in, in use anywhere? Right now, it's, it's, um, it's really in, demo, in, 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 in research stage. Um, obviously, there is a whole conservation community that has been proposed buff proposing buffer strips and, and other ways to tackle mostly runoff, meaning the water, the overland flow. You know, it rains, water flows, saturates the soil. What doesn't saturate the soil flows down. And, and, and if you have a buffer there where there is grasses or, or trees or whatever, they'll stop this flow. They'll stop the particles that, that, that are entrained in, in, entrain in that flow, and the creeks will be pr protected. Uh, those systems, however, don't really allow you to remove the harvestable crop. Um, so they're typically, you know, they could become a, a, a cost issue, right? Because then, you know, you have a farmer. He, it, it's kind of interesting because he has his own, um, you know, trade-off is really what makes him, you know, sustainable economically, right? You know, he has to make a living out of it. Uh, society's needs is, is a different kind of trade-off, you know. Do we want food, or do we, or do we, can we have both food and clean water, and, and how do we play that out? So what we think is that if you add something that is actually a harvestable crop, whenever the infrastructure will be there to accept these crops and, and, and process them into biofuels, it will be better because it actually provides some kind of economic sustenance to, to the whole system. It's not, it's not leaving nature take its course, pretty much. Yeah, and you also, so that, that would be on agricultural land, which is good land by and large, right? But you also see this playing a role on degraded land, places yeah. that you can't grow corn or other useful crops, right? Right, but even in, 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 in the agricultural land, I mean, in, arguably in Illinois, there is very little land that you can, wouldn't consider fertile, right? You have one of the best soils, the best soils in the, in, in the world. Um, however, a lot of this land was actually harvest, you know, usable for row crops or so on because it had been drained. And the big issue there is tile drains. I mean, if you didn't have tile drains that would actually take water and make this land free of water enough, you wouldn't be able to grow corn. So and again, that's a dilemma, right? Is, you know, it's most productive, but all that tile drains do is take the excess nitrogen and take it straight to the water, right? Right, and so for people who don't know how farming works, mm -hmm. which I, right. includes me, um, so a lot of times you're actually not, people think of farmers worrying about let too little water, but often the problem is you have, it's yeah. too wet, and so you have to drain that <laughs> right. water off and, and when it rains, right. and you're saying, and so instead of dispersing it through the, through the dirt, it sends it right into the stream, which right. goes right. eventually corn, into the Corn and soybeans or so really don't like to have their feet wet. They like enough water at the right time, <laughs> and not in excess. If, if it starts ponding or standing up for a little longer, especially in these particular delicate phases when it establishes itself, it can become a serious problem. And you can actually see hot, you know, empty spots in the field, so that's where the water was basically ponding, and so you don't. So they're very finicky in that sense. Mm -hmm. And so farmers have obviously have found ways to get around it, and basically if you can drain this land and you can remove the excess water, then you really have a super fertile soil and, and, and tremendous yields. Could you imagine using biofuel crops to remediate more toxic stuff? I mean, so we're not, not just talking about fertilizer here, mm -hmm. but also in you know industrial sites or, or those kinds of places. People have worked um, with in cleaning up um, bad things. 
Um, PCBs is one, you know, th th it's a really bad one. The solvents, as I mentioned, are pretty bad. Um, pesticides of various natures, they have all have been, you know, looked at at least. Uh, in that. The, the challenges with phytoremediation is the depth, obviously. I've mentioned that we are going down 30 feet, but that's pretty much the limit of it. Um, and there's a lot of places where contamination has gone much, much deeper, so that's, that's a probably an issue. Um, and also, if there's too much of it, then the plants don't like it. They're biological systems. They, they, they are subject to, to being intoxicated as well, right? So if the concentrations are too high, then trees won't be able to do it. But within those limits, there's a lot of other things, other nasty things that could be cleaned up. Yeah. And wh what is the potential for phytoremediation to, to work with radioactive pollution? We're talking about nuclear trees here. So we've talked about organics, we've <laughs> talked about, um, you know, including these kinds of fertilizers, some of these solvents, but what, ab but what about a place like Mound or, or whatever, where you've got radioactive pollution? Okay. Um, so we have studied um, the removal of radionuclides um, by using plants. Um, radionuclides are really nothing more than radioactive elements, right? So some of the uh, thoughts that um, we shared before or, or the thinking with heavy metals is similar if you talk about radionuclides. They don't go anywhere. They don't degrade. They are there and so you just move them from one place to the next. There has been, interestingly, obviously, a lot of research done uh, at the time where we were concerned about radioactive fallout from the nuclear tests, so the 60s or 70s or so. So some of the research is kind of old. Uh, but the whole discussion there is, yes, they will get into the food chain um, in one way or another. Um, most cases, though, the problem with them is that they do not do so in concentrations and, and in volumes that are large enough to actually be useful. Um, so, uh, and that's the, the big issue that confronted, for instance, people in Chernobyl. In Chernobyl has a, an exclusion zone about 30 kilometers in radius, 19 miles in radius where you cannot grow anything. And even to this date, there are not pl places where you cannot grow things because they basically transfer nuclides, radionuclides into the food and, and, and all that. And the problem is that, that there is not enough removal um, to make it cost effective. And the idea there was that we tried it and we said, okay, if we could actually, obviously, as we said at the very beginning, to remove soil and, and treat all of that soil is a tremendous effort, obviously, because of the volumes that are involved. If we could bioconcentrate it and then take the plants and instead of having to deal with, you know, tons and tons and tons of soil, we can just like it, you know, a hundredth of that in the weight of a plant that you can just chop down and, and, and collect and separate, that would be a fantastic thing. Unfortunately, the bioconcentration is not hard enough, it's not strong enough to actually make it work. There's some work it that needs to It doesn't pull up enough? Enough, and, and it bioconcentrated enough, so it will take enough, take a little bit for a long, long time, uh, instead of taking a whole lot in a very short time, which what we would like to, so sure. it's difficult. So let's talk about the, the nature of the work that you did at, at uh, Chernobyl. So what you did there wasn't final remediation exactly, but it was remediating some of the, some of the legacy contamination, right? We, we actually were dealing with the, with the results of unintentional final remediation, if you will. Because, <laughs> <laughs> no, in the sense that the, the fallout deposited cesium-137 onto the land, and the land was mostly um, used to grow uh, in particular, the big problem was cattle, you know, um, grass for, for cattle. And so the, gra the cattle was feeding on this land and they were accumulate cesium in their milk. So the grass was doing, was remediating. The grass was, was, re was removing from, from <laughs> yeah, from, from, from the soil, except not enough that you could actually take it all and, and put it away, but enough to create a problem in milk. As a matter of fact, people in the Chernobyl area were actually getting about 80% of their internal dose from the cesium that was in the milk. And at that time was a tremendous issue because parents were confronted with this terrible choice. Do, do I malnourish my child because I cannot give them milk? And at that time in 96 was really, you know, 86 was the, you know, the end of the Soviet, you know, regime and, you know, was probably a very hard time. So do I starve my child and, and malnourish him or give him a radiation dose? And so that was really playing in people's minds and so it was really, really tough to um, to work on that. And so milk was really considered like a staple food that had to be cleaned up. So how did you, what, so talk, talk about your project. Then. So my project was, I was actually working in trying to develop a technology was, that was owned by a small business, which had come up with the clever idea of um, creating some very, very tiny magnetic beads. You can 
think of um, something that looked like um, photocopier toner, if you, if you can imagine something like that. Okay, just a consistency, powder. the powdery place. Um, it, they had managed to coat it with a layer of a very specific adsorber who would actually trap the cesium. Um, so the idea was to take this powder and swirl it in the milk in, into a plant, and you've seen some of the uh, layouts um, in, in the dairy combine. Um, and after a certain contact time, you would actually power up a, an electromagnet, which would actually attract, these, these particles were actually had a little tiny magnetic charge in it. So when you activate the electromagnet, they will all be drawn to the magnet, and with that, remove the cesium, and then you would have clean milk. So the particles grab, grab <laughs> molecules grab. of cesium, yeah. bloop, bloop, bloop. and then yeah. turn on the magnet, and they all get sucked out. Sucked out, and you yeah. you have clean milk. Yeah, and the trick was actually to make sure they didn't take the calcium as well, and the potassium as well, and the good things in the milk, right? So, and they didn't release something back into the, into the milk that we, we didn't want. So we, that was the, 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 the work that was involved with, but, you know, we did try eventually a pilot unit at the refinery, at the refinery, sorry, the, at, the, at the milk uh, combine in, in Chernobyl. And how did, it, how did it go? The milk was cleaned up fine. Um, did you drink any? I actually did. Yeah? I was offered milk and, uh, and uh, yogurt and I don't remember what else, yes, so I did drink that milk. With no hesitation, you were fine with it? Well, I figured if people are there and, and drink it and live it you know, 365 days um, a year for many years, I could do it for couple of days. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so it worked in principle. It, it worked in principle, yes. Uh, then uh, the economics were probably hard, um, also because at that time um, the thought was, well, why go through all this when you can actually clean Im import milk from somewhere else that it's clean and it's easy and it's ready to go, just, you know, somebody is going to obviously make a profit out of it. But yeah. what, was, uh, what was working at Chernobyl like? Well, I don't even know what it looks like. I mean, I feel like people have this idea that it's all glowing. When I went there, I went there in 96, so 10 years after the explosion and the, and the accident. Um, there was a lot of, what struck me was the depression among people. You know, how people really had no hopes and no idea that they were in control of their lives. And um, it was just a very unsettling feeling. And physically, you can imagine this place and we went through the exclusion zone um, one time, moving from one place to the next. It was a crazy uh, drive, uh, chasing some big wig. But um, it's a, basically a place that's been abandoned and left in place as it is crystallized in time for 10 years at that time, and probably now for 25 years. So you have these roads that had not been maintained, logs everywhere and so on, and, and the kind of eerie appearance of somebody with a, dos with a dosimeter, a, a machine to basically monitor radiation. And then you would see in, you know, in, in the background like a little wisp of smoke coming out of a building and you know that that meant that some old people had actually gone back to the exclusion zone because they had been living there the whole life. They couldn't stand to be anywhere else in spite of radiation or anything else. So, and so really post-apocalyptic, yeah. post I mean it sounds um, just like yeah, a, yeah. a movie scene yeah. where you've got these old dead enders. Yeah. So refused to leave and the guy yeah. out there with his Geiger counter. Yeah, it was kind of looked like a movie, really, wow. one of those nasty movies, but um, yeah. yeah. So. Well, <laughs> let me take a moment to say that we are going to, um, uh, in just a few moments, open it up for audience questions, and there are two microphones here in either aisle. So if folks have questions, um, if you would care to line up at those mics in just a moment, we're going we're gonna to begin that. Um, and while people are, are doing that, let me just ask you, uh, in what ways do you think that either that type of technology or some of the phytoremediation stuff that you've been working on at the lab or elsewhere might have applications for some of the really pressing, you know, cleanup priorities we have today? In particular, of course, uh, uh, you know, thinking about Fukushima, Daiichi, and in, in Japan. That's where we have to invest money and, and really try to keep working at this. Um, obviously, no discovery is really made without funding. And so I think that's the important thing at this time. Uh, but having said that, um, Fukushima is one. Perhaps we can look at systems where we can actually decide whether we really want to try, try the route where we take up most of it and we make biofuels out of it or, or whatnot. Or we try the other way, you know, playing with plants that do not take up um, the pollutants, um, play with soil management um, techniques where you minimize the uptake and, and, and do that. So that would be a good thing. Um, the big, large problems of, of, uh, of non-point source pollution are also very good 
for, for this type of applications. Going back to the, to the nitrogen, phosphate, the pesticides that are, that are you know, the issue with, with, uh, with the agricultural context, the large scale things. I think we, we know how to handle the little, the, the, the confined places we need to tackle the large scale problems. Is it, uh, I mean, is the technology, the phytoremediation mm -hmm. specifically, just too long term for something so acute as, as what happened in Japan? I mean, it all it depends on your options. Yeah. It just all depends on your, on your options. Right now, it may well be the only choice in, for certain areas. I'm not talking about the, um, the, the site itself and the reactor. Obviously, there's nothing we can do there. But f for some of the pollution in, in the remote areas, how do you clean up you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of hectares cost effectively? You have to find a system that actually plays with what is going on in the system. You cannot think of digging everything up and taking it away. Right. right. Well, thank you so much. I, if folks do have questions, please step forward now and uh, can uh, sort of line up at the microphones, if you will. And uh, we do ask you to use the mics because we're, uh, we're taping this and want to make sure that we know what people want to know. So um, I'll go back and forth. And why don't we start over here, if you could just. Uh, Hi. Uh, on um, public television a few weeks ago, they had a fascinating two-hour special on Chernobyl and the return of the wolves. Mm -hmm and the interplay with all kinds of animals. Is there any way in research that you're conducting that there's some interplay with life, wildlife and birds as well as the plant life? Is, is there some way they could work together? And uh, it was amazing that these wolves are pretty healthy. I guess it doesn't affect them as much as it affects humans. Yeah, um, I should say that, yes, absolutely. And, and actually, one of the good things, we, we haven't done a lot of work with that, but it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's a natural for this, is really that whenever you have these natural areas, whether it's a Chernobyl or even our, our buffers in, in the environmental, in, in, in the agricultural world, what they also do is really create some ecosystem habitat because you're actually breaking down the, the, the non diversity of, of row crops. Altogether, so so once you put these systems together in, in a landscape vision, then you really decrease the fragmentation of habitat. You decrease the the you increase biodiversity, and therefore you actually have a lot of potential good things happening as far as the um, the wildlife. You see critters running around your site. All I time? do all the time. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we see everything. And we have I didn't mention it. We have another site that we have worked in Nebraska, and we were planting these little trees, and they were literally a few weeks old, and already we had nests. In the little, in, in the branches uh -huh. and everything else, it just took too much. That's great. So. Thank you. Yeah. Over here. I came in a little late, uh, so I hope I'm not asking you something that was covered. But um, once these trees reach maturity, um, and then you cut them down, um, so what then happens in the cycle uh, in terms of the waste that they've accum accumulated and withdrawn from the? Okay, uh, so. so I will give you an example of the argon site where we have these degradable, so to speak, compounds. Uh, what we have been busy doing is monitoring their concentration in the plant tissue, and we know that the, the products do not accumulate there. They are basically, if you, if you looked at it on a time scale, you'll have a high peak in the summer when the, the pull from transpiration is really strong, and then in the winter it tapes back off because, because they, don't, they stop working. So we know it's temporary. And so the plan is actually once the site will be cleaned up, these trees will be chopped down, used as mulch on site. We'll be analyzing them to make sure that there is nothing in there, as we, we wouldn't expect to be after a certain time, and then will be used as mulch on site. So there shouldn't be an issue there. If you had heavy metals, then you would have to be concerned about what stays in the tissue there, and then basically, based on its concentration, decide on what to do with it. But you still at least have less to deal with then, less yeah, volume absolutely. than you would if you were going to dig up exactly. all the Exactly, right. That's the, the key, that you would have a, a small amount concentrated in something that you can safely dispose of if need be, somewhere controlled, whether you have to do the whole soil, dig out the soil for you know, whatever depth you have and, and, and put it somewhere. Okay. Over here. Uh, my interest is in rapid reuse of sites uh, where contamination is found and I take it from your experience that um, some of the sites you can extract mm -hmm. by various techniques, water, water remediation or vapor remediation, but there's certain, uh, and, and you get stuff that's more lively, but what about metals? Metals don't seem to travel much, but if they're in place, um, what can you do about that except dig it out? 
Yes, metals are really a tough, a tough issue, and um, having a solution for metals would be ideal, but nobody has really come to one. I mean, the same problem dogs every possible removal technique, whether it's plants or, or some other chemical methods or so. Um, the discussion has been on do we need them in there, you know, what risk do they pose if they stay in there, and what risk do they pose if we remove them, and, and how can we do that? There's no real good solution, but, but for instance, what, what we've been discussing, for instance, with, with trees and, and plants and, and having a green cover is basically you minimize exposure routes. If you have a green surface, it obviously depends on the use of the land, but basically the idea is if you prevent, the big problem for lead, for instance, is ingestion, right? So whether it's a kid touching you know, paint or soil and then putting in their mouths or, or things like that, if you prevent that, you're already ahead of, of the game. Unfortunately, metals are very, very hard to, to remove. Just a, a note on that. I was involved in examining a site um, that ha was heavily contaminated with metals. Um, and it turned out that somebody had decided to put a, a, a children's nursery school there. And what do children do? They eat dirt. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Mine do. Uh, fascinating discussion. Thank you both. Um, just to follow up sort of on uh, the other gentleman's question, in an instance like uh, Mound, uh, the primary objective obviously is to, to clean the land. Is the secondary objective beautification or is it eventual reuse of the land? I think it was eventual reuse. Or, yeah. I think eventually the, the, the main objective is, is reduce the health hazards to the people who are exposed, might be exposed nearby. That was the number one issue. And so there's, there, there have been numerous studies that are that have been exploring this and how, what is the, the dose, what would be the dose, of what, are, what kind of scenarios can you run of potential exposure, um, what would be the, 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 the dose that anybody would, would get doing particular everyday functions or, or, or life and so on. Uh, beautification in that particular case was not really the critical thing. I think that the big thing was the health impact. Um, and so the evaluation of various alternatives to how to deal with it had to grasp with that. Have you ever considered uh, remediation in the Allegheny Appalachian area that has been uh, hit by coal mining and now uh, fracking of natural gas? I have not done it, but there's sorry. Um, I have not done it, but there's people who have actually worked in, in the Appalachian. There's people at the USDA who have done tremendous work on that. Do you see any of the coal byproducts, coal ash, that kind of thing? I mean, would, would fight remediation have anything to perhaps, offer? For perhaps, that? perhaps, yes. But the, hydrocarbons the, the, generally. Hydrocarbons, yes, definitely, definitely hydrocarbons. Problem with the ash is the pH and, and, and a lot of issues that may not be totally compatible with plants. But uh, it, it could it need to be looked at. Yep. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It was buried in here. <laughs> Great ahead. Oh, did I miss somebody over here? I'm sorry. The, the lights are yes, terrible. Sir. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, you mentioned you wanted to clean the Chicago River. Is there a water plant that can help you with that? Yes, there could be plants that can help with that. Do you hear me? Okay, okay I'll hold it. There could be plants, uh, but I think what does it is not so much the specific plants, it's how you put them together and um, how you design your system. You need engineers and, and hydrologists and hydrogeologists and a lot of different people who can help us do that. Can I ask, do you mean plants like, like a treatment plant or a plant like a green plant? Green plant. Yes. Right. Yes, there are. So, I mean, are there, are there even algaes or anything like that that could... Help? I guess not. I mean, what happens to that stuff? It all gets sort of washed away. Yeah. Uh, algae have a problem that you have to re filter them back out, re recover them. But, yeah. Well, you know, we do now with the water, we do it, you know, we do it kind of a natural process with the wastewater treatment system, right? Those are microbes that actually do what nature would do itself, except they're upstreams. And one, one, once you have runoff or water that's polluted from other sources, then you have to find something that's a little different. Gotcha. Great. Now over here. Thanks. My question is that, and I came late too, so my apologies if this has been addressed. My question um, came about because of something mentioned. Who are the teams or the groups of people who get together, the professions, the engineers, 
to work on, um, for instance, a Chernobyl or even a spot of land that's not growing things. Um, I was just curious. So in order to create a system that can work for you, you need really input from a lot of, um, of different um, expertises and, and professions. Uh, this is the ultimate multidisciplinary effort you need. I'm an agronomist and that tells you how plants grow and how you make a crop, pretty much. Uh, but I would not be able to do the work that I've been doing if I didn't have environmental engineers working with me, if I didn't have hydrogeologists that create a model and tell me where the groundwater flows, how fast, how much, and all that, and, and help me determine where I put my trees so that I would, don't take out more water than I want and I don't take water that I don't want to take away. Uh, then, there obviously, there will be people who understand risk and risk assessment, particularly for Chernobyl. They'll have to figure out what is the least problematic way, put, put the radionuclides in the plant or leave them in the soil, dig out, not dig, you know, plant the trees, what would be the exposure of somebody who works that, so there will be that effect. Um, I've wor we've worked with air modelers just to see if the, what goes into the air would create an issue, and so they have to tell me, you know, with, you know, with the winds going and, and all that, and the sun shining, how long my, my chemicals will stay in the air before they get, you know, uh, destroyed and degraded. There's a lot of people, and last but not least, obviously, people who know how to deal with money, right? Because if it does not <laughs> work out from that perspective, there's no way we can make it happen. So there's a lot of people who have to say into this. It's great. That's a good question. Thank you. Here you um, I noticed, sorry. I noticed that uh, the plants were mostly implemented as an after the fact solution. Do you think that it would be possible to have plants put in before even a plant is put there? Like we actually talked a lot, and, and we, we, a few years ago we talked about sentinel trees and, and, and way that you could actually design landscape that serve two, two uses. One is to beautify an industrial complex, a, a plant, and the second is act as little canary, um, uh, canaries in, in the mine, coal mine, right? And so just, you know, hopefully turn a different color if there's something else. And actually there is somebody um, that actually had devised a system, and I don't, haven't seen that used, but as far as research was very intriguing. There was this uh, scientist that was working for the Office of Naval Research, if I'm not wrong, and she actually had found a way to um, genetically engineer some plants so that when they were exposed to doses, and I don't remember what the compound was, but it was a nasty chemical, they would turn totally white. They would top the chlorophyll <laughs> being produced or something would turn white. So you could potentially go around your site and, and look at your plants and, and figure out um, that something was going on. Um, other work has been done in this sense has been people are, are I have been talking about um, sensitive, sensitive plants, plants that are particularly sensitive to a particular chemical, and put them, for instance, uh, next to pipelines or things like that. Uh, therefore, somebody could go either from the air or, or just walking along the pipeline, see if these plants were still alive or dead, and, and perhaps figure out if there was a leak or, or some other nasty chemical spill. That's cool. <laughs> um, we've only got a couple minutes left, so whoever is still standing, then we'll, we'll take your questions last. And anybody who hasn't gotten to the mics, I'm sorry, but you can, I'm sure you can track down Christina later. Uh, go right ahead. Good morning. Um, I have two quick questions. One is, for those of us who are not scientists, how can we best educate ourselves? Is there a, a certain book or books um, besides following your you know, coverage of what you're doing in the newspapers and magazines and environmentally in general, you know, certain websites? And the other one, if I can sneak it in real fast, is um, can people go, people meaning the public, go to Argon and see this grove or whatever of a thousand trees that you had planted? Yes, yeah, so the first question is where can uh, people get educated on this? Uh, I would recommend you, you Google um, phytoremediation um, and look specifically at the EPA website. They actually have a, had a really, really good document uh, a few years ago, I guess, but it hasn't changed a whole lot, which is a citizen's guide for, to phytoremediation. They really did a good job in, in, in um, advertising and, 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 um, and explaining it very, very simply and very neatly. Um, EPA, by the way, is, is a strong proponent of this technique. Um, and, um, and the second argon is open. Uh, you just need to um, open to, to visits. We have a, um, a communication and public affairs group at Argon that actually uh, offers tours and, and visits all the time. So I would recommend you look at the website, 
www.anl.gov and you'll you'll find all the information. But you can't just wander. wander no, in there, no, you have to make an appointment. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you had talked earlier about the contaminants and how they're pulled up into the plants, and then there was a question asked about what happens to the contaminants, um, and you said that they're not retained or aggregated in the tissue. Um, so does that mean that there are all of them are released into the atmosphere? And you had said that some um, are oxidized, and so they're made either completely harmless or less harmful. Is there some that just get released? Some of them does, does get released, but as I say, it, it's broken down by, by the UV light. Um, some of that actually gets degraded inside the plant. So if you look for the original trichloroethane, you know, the TCE in the plant, you, chances are you won't find it for a long time. It breaks down. It breaks down eventually to CO2 and water in different proportions, different times. Obviously, it's, it takes maybe a little longer, a little uh, faster, depending on weather and, and other conditions, but yes. And is there some contaminants that just simply get released into the atmosphere and we really don't want them there? As I said, uh, the, you know, the majority of the, of the chemicals that go into the air gets, get broken down by sunlight, and eventually all of them will, will get broken down by, by the sunlight, at these particular compounds that I've tested. It may not be all, of, all, of, all the chemicals, we haven't really tried all of them, but if you look at the scientific literature, there's a lot of these compounds that actually get broken down um, into the air. And, uh, and we're really talking about very minute concentrations. It's something that is really in the parts per billion, if not per trillion range. So it's very, very tiny. So the potential for being destroyed is, is very high because it, they don't really accumulate up. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Last question. Okay. Well, maybe I can ask two. First of all, for the techniques that work, uh, is there any plan to do a survey of what spots in the country might be able to use these remedial techniques? Uh, and then number two, and you may not be able to answer this one, but I've heard that Roundup because it kills all the weeds, uh, it actually increases uh, soil runoff. Uh, is, is that something you could comment on? Okay, um, the, the first question was how you uh, utilize this, how you can... Uh, if, if there could be a survey done yeah. to figure out what spots in the country might be able to use this technique. Again, the EPA has done a lot of work in, in uh, mapping, for instance, old brownfields. And so I, I, you know, what would probably be required is, is really to compare their database in, in the brown. They have a lot of GIS data on, on land use and, and brownfields and all that. So I would imagine at some point you would try to put two or two together and actually there are tools like decision trees and things like that to help you figure out what would be the best remedy for each part of land and contamination. So, so that could be done. It's, it's not being done yet, but it could be done. As far as Roundup, um, it's an interesting question in the sense that, yes, it does kill the weeds and, and goes there, but it also has been proposed as a, a better way to decrease runoff because it would be used in alternative to tilling, and tilling is a, one of the major, obviously, soil loss concerns. So. Um, like everything, you know, you need to look at the specific situation and, and, and look at both sides. What is it replacing and what is you use it instead? Uh, in fact, the no-till agriculture is really based on, perhaps not necessarily Roundup, you know, it itself, but basically is, is basically um, driven by the fact that you do not plow the land and so you don't leave the land exposed to additional runoff. And, and you basically, you know, plant corn, for instance, on top of no non-tilled land, and, and in order to control weeds, you have to apply herbicides. So, it could go both ways, I guess. Lots of, yeah, complex. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much. This has been an absolutely fascinating uh, thread to follow through from the beginning to the end. Uh, really, Christina Negri, thanks so much, and thank you all for coming today. Thank you.